I think all four of us are set. Uh, while you're uh, grabbing some uh, nourishment, uh, we will begin. Uh, again, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you all for your interest and your commitment in addressing the important issues of housing, aging in place, and uh, reforming our neighborhoods and communities so that we can all grow and age gracefully wherever we choose to reside. Uh, let me thank uh, Dr. Jack Rowe for his opening comments and uh, I think what resonated uh, with me was his challenge that uh, we are not prepared for an aging population and uh, we take that challenge uh, hold, hold, uh, seriously and this panel in part will begin to address some of the policy programmatic uh, steps that we can take to begin the long process of preparing for our aging. And of course, a tremendous thank you to Secretary Cisneros. He's been the godfather of this project, our leader, and uh, the editor of what we believe will be a seminal volume on aging in place, housing, and the built environment. I would only add one additional item to Secretary Cisneros and Dr. Rose uh, opening comments in a recent issue of the gerontologist which focused on aging baby boomers and the plethora of issues that they represent one fascinating and maybe even startling statistics did you know did we know that one in three baby boomers today those that are roughly between 45 and 65 years of age one in three of us is single, is single, lives alone, primarily divorced or never married and or as a widow or widower. And this is just before they begin to reach that next stage of their aging process where we can expect that even more will wind up being alone by either losing a spouse, a partner, uh, and thus we're going to also have to confront the large number of us that will be living alone and thus how do we address their needs as they age in place or choose to live in certain neighborhoods. Well, we have with us today a wonderful panel of experts. I will introduce them at the front end and then they will proceed to share their insights on how we can begin at least in the public realm through public policy and programs, legislation, interventions, model programs, how we can begin that process of addressing the aging of society. We are fortunate to have uh, Estelle Richmond, the uh, Acting Deputy Secretary for HUD. She manages the day-to-day -day operations of that uh, great agency, and you yourself have many years of public service. And before that, she was uh, Secretary of Public Welfare in the great state of Pennsylvania. Thank you uh, for being with us, Estelle. Uh, following her, to her right and my right and your left is uh, Eileen Rosenthal, the Deputy Secretary of the Maryland Department on Aging. She has served there for over 20 years, has been active in aging and long-term care, and she's responsible for many of the public programs, including the Medicaid waiver that allow older persons to live in their homes and communities. Following uh, to my right and uh, next to me is my wonderful colleague from AARP, Nancy Lamond, the Executive Vice President of AARP State and National Group. She leads our government relations, our advocacy, our public education efforts, and she has the important responsibility of overseeing our 50 state offices, including Washington, D.C., Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Thank you, Nancy, for joining us. And, uh, Lastly, my great colleague from many years, uh, Dr. Robin Stone, way on that end, the Executive Director of, Leading Age, of the Leading Age Center for Applied Research. Dr. Stone is one of the nation's noted scholars and policy researchers on aging and long-term care, and she was formerly the CEO for the Chief Operating Officer for the International Longevity Center in New York. So we have a, a wonderful and expert panel, and I'd like to begin with Nancy. Um, you get the honors. Thank you. And um, uh, 
I'd like you to first address uh, how AARP foresees the aging of society, your insights and your thoughts on how we can move forward. Sure. Well, thank you, and thank you all for being here today. It's a wonderful uh, location. I'm, by, uh, I'm a fallen away city planner. I was trained as a city planner. C turned out I had no skill as an architect or planner, but, uh, um, but fortunately, AARP deals in this area, and many of my colleagues are here. Um, we have five minutes, and so to try to keep within that time frame, I tried to do basically five tweets. But since I'm older, I'm going to surround them with a couple of paragraphs. Uh, <laughs> but hopefully, we can move through AARP's uh, role in this area through five kind of headlines uh, moving on. Uh, the first is, um, and again, probably all of this will be somewhat repetitive. Uh, for, we're getting older, and it's happening everywhere. In the US, we know that the older population over the age of 65 will nearly double by 2030. Put this in perspective, by the time today's toddlers become college age, a blink of an eye for most of us, this country will have twice as many people over the age of 65. Looking ahead to that period, all 50 states are going to see a rapid acceleration in the growth of their uh, older populations as boomers age. And the untold story, we don't have time to go through a lot of the geography, is what's happening in the younger states. Wyoming currently ranked 38th in the country. New Mexico ranked 31st. By 2030, these two states are going to be third and fourth as a percentage of their population age 65 will increase by more than 100%, the largest increases among states during that period. In short, there are no Benjamin Button states. No one is getting any younger. At the same time, we know people want to stay in their homes. Uh, we all have research. Uh, roughly 90% of people want to stay in homes as they age. So just to frame this as others have already, this is a tremendous challenge. And we know that not every state and not every city, though we have a mayor who um, has taken steps, are really ready for this uh, tremendous challenge ahead. Second, houses built to last, yes, but built to adapt, probably not. Um, when I think about this, I think about a cartoon in The New Yorker where two apparently high-income city-dwelling people are talking to one another at a bar, and one asks the other, but do you think our relationship can fit into a studio apartment? Um, well, we don't want to speculate on their relationship, but we do know that we can't fit our current older population into the current housing. And across the country, we're going to have to update our housing stocks, um, many of which are many years old, as old as uh, people over the age of 65, so that people can stay in their homes as long as they want. AARP has a long history of promoting accessible housing. Uh, Fernando mentioned we have offices in every state. Many of them are working on it. We've worked in three ways primarily. First is, in some communities, such as Westchester, New York, we've worked to pass legislation. There we have legislation requiring 50% of future affordable housing to have inclusive design features. So legislation is one route for us. Second, we've worked to inform our members um, and other boomers uh, and older Americans um, and provide them with the tools they need to understand how to upgrade their own homes or the homes of their parents. So our second activity has been um, basic education and encouragement. And then the third area, and it's an area we need to do more work, is to work with industries, whether it's the renovators or the home builders, to see if we can play a role in helping them adapt. And we're working a little bit right now um, with KB Home, based in um, California and Texas, um, to see if they could do for accessible housing what they've done for sustainability um, in housing. And we think it's very important to work with, um, with the private sector uh, as well. Uh, third point. Uh, your home may still be your castle, but it is no longer your pension or your rock solid asset. Um, so think of it, for many years, our homes were thought to be 
yet another pension we were going to have. That's simply not the case anymore. Um, others have given a lot of the statistics, but we know that the housing bubble, um, since then, there's been a tremendous drop uh, and loss in equity and um, uh, flexibility for homeowners. Um, median home values have declined since 2007 by more than $30,000, and this obviously is creating a major strain on older Americans. Um, again, uh, the myth is that older people own their homes outright, uh, but we know that fewer households, 50 plus, now own their home free and clear than before the recession. Um, and to be blunt, this is a serious problem uh, as we move ahead. Uh, the fourth and a hopeful sign uh, amidst these uh, somewhat challenging uh, notions is uh, we see sproutings of all age friendly communities across the country. Not nearly as many as we're going to need if we're going to de deal with this tremendous change, but there are very hopeful signs. And uh, we're working now with the World Health Organization on a network of age friendly cities. We're working with other organizations that have uh, uh, cropped up. And a key part of this has been a complete streets program. Many of you are familiar with them. And what's important about this is to make streets and communities friendlier, not just to the grandfathers, but to a mother pushing a stroller and a child at play. And I have a general view. Uh, I do a lot of walking, which is you shouldn't have to be a former Olympic sprinter of any age to get across the street before the light changes. Um, in New York City, where we've worked uh, extensively with government, nonprofits, um, implementing complete streets policy, traffic deaths among older persons declined 41% over seven years, and pedestrian fatalities of all ages are down 20%. So when we have our volunteers walking through communities with their charts looking at streets, uh, this isn't just a uh, friendly time-filling activity. This is something we know ultimately will save lives. Um, fifth, never underestimate the power of ingenuity. Um, we know that most of these solutions are likely not going to be from government. They are not going to be top down. And just think about it. Right now, you can't read a newspaper that doesn't talk about boomerang kids moving back with their parents. I'm experiencing it in a month as my son finishes law school um, and is coming back home. But think about it. As you think of our next generation and the amount of money they have for their later years, we not, may not be talking about boomerang kids, but as I like to say, parents who are uh, embodiments of the man who came for dinner and stayed and stayed and stayed. And this is going to happen. It's not going to be preordained, but we know it is, a, uh, uh, it is likely to be one of those options that are considered. And of course, we've all watched uh, Golden Girls. We all know that, uh, that opportunities to come together. Anna Quinlan just had a book reviewed yesterday where um, they talked about the possibility of her, her saying, I know a bunch of friends are going to come together and end up living uh, with one another. And of course, the embodiment of this has been the village concept, where families come together and uh, have a compact uh, where they, uh, uh, they contribute and pay for services for a community. So we know that there's an enormous amount of ingenuity happening around the country. We hope to be even more engaged as an organization than we've been before. Uh, we have two great assets to do that. As, as Fernando said, we have offices in every state. But more importantly, we have millions of volunteers, all of whom are active in their communities and want to engage. So with that, I uh, try great. to hit my time frame and Thank turn you, it back Nancy. to you. Thank you, Nancy. You've set a great standard. And we're going to go down <laughs> the line. And then I will ask each one one question. And then we want uh, an opportunity for you to also respond, react. <coughs> and we have mics on either end. And so we'll carve out some time for that as well. Estelle, thank you for being with us. Thank you, and um, let me add one correction. Um, our deputy secretary has been confirmed. Oh, <laughs> congratulations. Um, so I am now the senior advisor um, to the secretary, basically on the things I love, which are um, anything that has to do with housing and social services, particularly the last one with HHS and um, many of our partners that are looking at these very same issues and recently had an opportunity to work with AARP. Um, um, let me also say, Mr. Secretary, thank you for all of those who are pre-baby boomers who are, are getting there sooner rather than later. Um, we appreciate not only the book, but your foresight and where we're going. And one more thanks to 
um, um, to all of you who are really focused on our veterans. One of our, our issues is to also eliminate um, veterans' homelessness. Um, we still have way too much of it, and it's going to be done through providing not only the supports through VA, but most of all those supports and housing opportunities within HUD. Um, as you know, many of our, our elderly, um, even those with moderate incomes, only a few short years ago lived in really deplorable um, conditions. But with the National Housing Act, we were really able to change that. At this point in time, about 1.4 of our nation's elderly actually live in, in HUD housing. Um, safe, decent, affordable housing. It's um, an awful lot of people. And folks often think they live in our 202 housing, which was specifically created for, for seniors to live um, with dignity and with grace. But I would tell you even more of our, our seniors live in our, our, use our vouchers and live in our, our public housing um, and use and, and are served within our public housing venue. Um, we actually serve 45,000 seniors in our project-based Section 8 and more than 325,000 seniors um, in our public housing program. Um, but as this has um, um, become important, it's going to become even more important um, as the baby boomers continue to age. Um, it's a wide spectrum, and while many of our, our seniors do <coughs> live in their own homes and are able to um, look at aging in place, even a larger number of our seniors are dependent upon public housing, government supports, in order to be able to live comfortably. And these particular seniors are also very vulnerable. Um, an accident, an illness, um, that often could have someone returning to their own home. These, these seniors have become more vulnerable to be moved to nursing facilities. And I probably don't have to tell this group um, that for every senior that may be in a nursing facility, we can have them live in their own home significantly less expensively. Usually somewhere around two, two and a half folks. If we can provide the home health care, if we can provide the supports, if we can have them return to their, to their home and provide that aging in place support for them, we not only Im improve their quality of life, we also um, save the government um, um, millions and millions of dollars. Another one of the factors that we have learned is that this is a partnership. It's not done just by HUD. It's done by all of us working together at the local level, at the national level. But it's all of the partners, partners coming together to understand the importance of community-based living and aging in place. And those partners are with the Department of Health and Human Services, they're with HUD, they're with transportation, um, and there are with many other community planners that are at the local level. I want to particularly focus a little bit, and I think um, 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 Nancy has touched on it too, is the importance of transportation and the importance of being able to move in your community in a way that you can, that a senior can provide for their own needs. Too often we've become so dependent on, on cars that we forget that many of us at a given age may have to give up that car, but we still want to do our own shopping. We still want to be able to attend our church. And the public transportation alternatives, as you move from very large cities to small, rural, and, and more intimate communities, isn't always there. One of the things that, that HUD is focused on um, is our sustainability of housing and communities in which we are providing grants for communities to plan where they're going so they can look at the transit-oriented development and neighborhood revitalization. And these are critical as we begin to look at how our communities mature for us. While in, in many cases, those of us who are pre-baby boomers may not have all of those advantages, but certainly as Montana and Wyoming reach it, we should have done some of this planning. We should be ready. We should take these opportunities to make sure that we do have not only housing programs that are in place, but transit systems, healthcare systems, our, our religious and faith-based communities all rallying around together to create that environment where people can indeed not only age in place, 
but live in place. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, next we'll hear from Eileen, your opening thoughts. Thank you, and uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here today. Um, I, I would have to say one of the biggest challenges we face at the public policy arena is just the, um, has to do with functional decline and the onset of chronic disease. Mm -hmm. And it has an impact, you know, our housing needs to address that. We, we've done a lot of things. Um, the, the Americans with Disabilities Act has done a wonderful job of addressing public accommodations, but we really haven't reached consensus on what we need to do with our housing. Um, I, I like to laugh when I go into um, communities. I often go to ribbon cuttings of 55 plus communities. And, and I, you know, I'm always pleased when I see a local jurisdiction actually developing a housing code that addresses that and requires certain things to happen. But then I go to the ribbon cutting and I see, okay, so there's a, a zero threshold entrance, but then you go into the bathroom and there's a step. They have a, it's a shower, but you still have to walk over a step. And when I said, well, what happens with, to a person in a wheelchair? How do they get in the shower? Oh, well, we, it's an option. You can pay to have that step eliminated. So you have to laugh. Um, I also, you know, I look at the term universal design, and people tend to associate it with the older adult population and with people with disabilities, and yet it really does need to be universal. It does need to address the uh, change, our changes over a lifetime. A lot of our housing assumes that people are going to be like June Cleaver and Ward Cleaver, and they're never going to grow old, and Ward is never going to have a stroke, and never going to have to figure out how to manage in a, an environment that's not very friendly to uh, an older person. Uh, I look at a lot of our older housing, since so many of our seniors who live in their own homes are almost always living in older homes. Uh, they have typically lived in that same home for 20 to 40 years. So that tells me a couple of things. One that the home was not built for people with mobility problems. It was built for people who were never going to have problems going up and down steps. So when I look at a lot of our older homes, particularly in Baltimore City, even in the suburbs, you see no bathroom on the first floor. You see the um, washing machine is in the basement. And it's just never, no one ever considered back then how to um, design for what was going to happen over a lifetime. I'm not sure we get it today. Um, I know that there's still no consensus on things that we should have in our homes. Uh, I can tell you one time uh, my own mother stayed with my kids babysat for me when I was out of town. And when I got back, and I don't live in an old home, and I'm embarrassed to admit, she said to me, you know, I couldn't take a shower in your house. And I looked at her and she said, well, you don't have any grab bars. So that was an embarrassment for me to admit that I live in a relatively new house that doesn't have grab bars. So why aren't we thinking of those things? I would, one of the things that we're doing in Maryland is looking at this concept of NORC. Um, there was an initiative under the Administration on Aging about 10 years ago that provided funding for NORCs around the country. And there were a couple of grantees in Maryland and when the federal funds ended, the state stepped in and provided some ongoing financial support. And the individuals behind these NORCs actually decided to take it a step further and they introduced legislation in Maryland that created what they called a Senior Empowerment Zone Commission, uh, borrowing on the Federal Empowerment Zone um, pro program. And what it did was it, it, it required the state to really look at what it would take to create a senior-friendly community, what's involved. And so one of the recommendations that came out of our commission was to develop a program where the state of Maryland could actually create uh, incentives and designate specific communities who met certain criteria uh, that as a community for a lifetime. Uh, this is, is not a new concept. I have to give credit to the state of Florida, which actually uh, developed that. And there are communities in Florida that have been designated. And what I found interesting in Florida, in these communities, I've seen myself, the lighting, just the, the street signs are bigger. Uh, they're illuminated, so you can see them even at night. There's, there, there are more walkable communities. So there, there's a whole lot we need to learn from some of the other um, examples that have been set for us. Now, if you were to ask me what do we need to do at the federal level, uh, I think clearly a continued commitment to the production of affordable housing. We have lots of people 
who um, are waiting, they're on a waiting list to move into some of these wonderful buildings that we have throughout this country. And it's, it's sad when people have to wait and, and they're told either there's no waiting list because the, there's so many people on it, or the waiting list could be a couple of years old. Um, I also think we have to do a better job of figuring out how to integrate services in housing because really the key to successful aging in place is not only the physical design and layout of the home, but how do you make the environment um, friendly and, and suitable for the in introduction of services in that housing. Okay. Thank you, uh, Eileen. You've uh, given us a number of important issues to return to. And I'd like to now turn it over to Robin, your thoughts, and then sure. we'll be back in turn. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, thank you for allowing us to be in this incredible building. I've lived in D.C. on and off for over 35 years, and I am always overwhelmed at this fabulous space. Um, I, I think today I'm actually going to put on the provider hat. Uh, I seem to be the <coughs> person up here who represents uh, housing providers, uh, for those of you who don't know Leading Age, we're a national organization of aging services providers and we run the gamut from very high-end continuing care retirement communities to the largest single conglomeration of affordable housing providers for seniors in the country. We have Retirement Housing Foundation uh, out in the audience today as one of our represent rep representatives here. Uh, and let me just say, I think the segue to what I want to say around policy um, has been set up very nicely. Um, most of the focus of our organization, while we love the fact that people with means can survive in the future, um, our real concern, and in particular, a creation of a new center on the future of affordable housing with services at uh, Leading Age, which was just announced at our spring meeting last week, is that if we don't do something about low and modest income seniors in the future, we are missing the sleeper issue. Uh, affordable housing, and not just people staying in their own homes, but having other options. As was said before, people are now not owning their homes outright. We have reached a plateau of home ownership in this country. And with the longevity that, that Jack talked about before, we, it is not going to be unusual if you live to 65 to have at least a three in five chance of living to at least 90 or 95 and over. And if you look at the economic situation that was just um, highlighted in the housing publication that came out a couple of weeks ago that AARP has highlighted, this a is a serious, serious issue for us. When I came here in the early 70s, HUD was a booming organization. The focus was on the future of affordable housing. I can tell you I've aged in place in this field because I've been working in aging since 1975 when I started at AARP, when it was a mere 12 million members. And there is less attention to these issues now as we see the baby boom just reaching the, the aging of the population than there were three decades ago. And there's a reason for that. We were very successful with our Medicare and Social Security and other programs of bringing a lot of elderly out of poverty. But I will tell you that the statistics look grim. We are looking at substantial increases in low and very modest income elderly living into very old ages. And housing is the infrastructure for within which they need to be supported and be safe. If they don't have a roof over their heads, the fastest growing group of the homeless right now is the elderly. So these issues are significant. What Leading Age and our organization believes from a policy perspective is that we need to think of housing as a platform for where people live in a community, as a base for bringing health and supportive services in. We actually believe that there are Medicare and Medicaid savings to be achieved by linking housing with services. And thankfully, with the new MacArthur grant, my group is going to be able to actually look at the effects of service-enriched housing on Medicare and Medicaid utilization. But we believe we have room for actually saving dollars and actually maybe even getting some of those dollars back into the housing side of the equation. On the nursing home, we pay for room and board. 
We do not use our dollars in an efficient way to actually support housing in any other environment. We are going to have to look at new ways of financing affordable housing, whether it's in people's own homes, but quite frankly, we need more congregate settings. Many people should not remain in their own homes when they're 90 years old. They need to have options, and this does not mean that they have to go into a nursing home and nobody can afford assisted living. So the options have to be out there for congregate environments of all shapes and sizes. Thinking about how we bring Medicare, Medicaid, public financing at the federal and the state level, and what is the role of the private sector, including some of the work that we're now doing with enterprise community partners, looking at social investment bonds, and thinking about how we might get private investors to invest not only in the affordable housing piece of this, but to invest in the services side together as a package where we can show and demonstrate to the feds and to the states that we can save money on the health side, we can keep these properties, we can keep housing in better shape physically because when you have a healthy elderly person, the home around them is not going to fall apart. And we can think about using some of these dollars to retrofit and to really push for a uni universal design policy. You know, it's interesting. I have taken some of the models that we have ex explored in, in our own organization, and I've taken them to places like Singapore. And Singapore is now actually implementing several of the models that we have developed here in the United States. And yet, we have trouble selling this to our own federal government and to states and local communities. It is a mindset that needs to be different. And that is, as, as, as I think Secretary Cisneros said so eloquently, it was his mother's house that was so important to her. Singapore was built on the notion that everybody should have a house. That was actually their basic premise for the country being founded 60 years ago. We need to have a housing policy in this country that acknowledges the same thing. And it's not just home ownership. It's about wherever we live. It's our home. And that has to be a foundation. So we're really excited about the potential to look at some of the outcomes that we're, we're exploring with the MacArthur money. But more importantly, it's then how to take those findings and influence practice and policy. I think the book that I actually haven't seen yet, but I'm really looking forward to looking at it. It sounds like it brings a lot of those things together. Um, I would just leave you with one other thought, and that is, is that I'm trained as in public health. I actually think housing is a public health issue. And we tend to frame it in a public health model. If you think about it, a neighborhood is a population-based public health entity. And if we think about housing as the hub, Housing becomes the, not only the bricks and mortar, but the glue that really holds the population together. And so if we take a population-based public health approach to our housing issues, then maybe we can think about some public health solutions to how we create healthy, aging, and vibrant environments for people as they age. Great. Thank Thanks. you very much. And thank you each for your insightful comments and your reality check. Uh, to, to Laura and, and Henry, I believe we have the makings of a volume two of <laughs> that book. So we'll keep that in mind. Uh, let me just give, uh, pose a question to each one and we'll open it up for discussion, but I want to you to start thinking who would like to come up to the mic to respond, add, disagree, agree, or share your insights. But uh, your first reality check, Nancy, is that uh, I should not count on our two properties as my piggy bank, my retirement, or uh, my get rich quick. Is that correct? Right. Um, I don't know about you, but I feel more depressed. <laughs> so <laughs> there, went, there went my big speculative dream. But uh, I just want to ask you this, Nancy. <clears throat> uh, I, ha I am fortunate to be on both the board of the AARP, but also its charitable arm, the AARP Foundation. And the foundation is focused on a number of critical issues for an aging society, including isolation. Right. Uh, isolation. And uh, what I'd like to ask you, uh, given that AARP has roughly 35 to 38 million members, how do we take that potential 
political clout, that uh, tremendous energy of so many members, to create a movement that can put these issues uh, at the top of the national agenda? And how do we do that without alienating young people? Well, that's and a very all that in two minutes. That's a very important question for me, coming from a board member. Um, <laughs> and you better uh, get the right answer. I'm uh, just yeah, kidding. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, well, uh, it is it is essential that as we work through any and all of these issues, we not just talk about multiple generations, but we look at the real opportunities to address issues that cut across age. And um, I think that's increasingly so. Um, a couple of panelists talked about the needs for change of mindsets, and uh, I think there are two that are very significant, um, one of which I've dealt with a lot. I spend most of my time on Medicare and Social Security and legislative fights, and what has really astounded us has been the there is a presumption in the policy and, and lawmaker community that seniors are pretty well off and <coughs> that they're doing pretty well and may need a little help here and there, but that is an underpinning, and we have a tremendous amount of education to do. I deal, as I say, mainly recently in Medicare and Social Security, but I can tell you on issues related to housing, the education challenge for policymakers is tremendous. It's certainly true at the national level, and I believe it's true at the state level. And the ability, I think, for us to talk about these in terms of what's important for all generations, whether it's accessibility, which works for everyone, or affordability, which is important for the family and the, the extended family. I think it's going to be a, a hugely important issue for us. One of the things we've found is we've worked across the country, and, and one of the things we need to do in terms of activating our members, and we're trying to, is to become active in communities, cities, states, where policymakers are starting to look at the challenge of an older population and work with them, bring people together. But we have to continue to, uh, to engage our membership in a way that they're focused on it and educated on it. Great. Thank you for, I think what you're suggesting is an, part of an intergenerational social movement around these Indeed. issues. Uh, Estelle, uh, I, I had the good fortune to begin my career uh, with HUD as a housing management officer hmm. out of the San Francisco uh, area office. Uh, overseeing Section 202 and Section 8, and uh, so I really, I'm proud of having begun my career with, with HUD so many years ago. One thing I learned then that continues to be the case is this concept of nimbyism and uh, discrimination and discomfort between older persons and planning commissions and zoning boards, and if we're to move forward with all these great ideas about the built environment, design, new infrastructure, livable communities, et cetera, et cetera, how do we begin to address the potential discomfort by others towards old people, persons with disability, and what's the role of HUD in addressing uh, these kind of uh, land use issues, the uh, NIMBYs and the LULUs? That, that's, that's actually a great question. And you, if you could define those two terms for the audience. <laughs> uh, let, me, let me start off by saying it's a little different from your background. I've spent my entire career, except for the last two years, in health and human services. I see. Um, with the, the last seven years running the Medicaid program um, in Pennsylvania. Um, and I would tell you that the largest barrier that I found in all of human services across the board, you choose the area, it's the biggest barrier was in housing. Um, and in, in choice, accessibility, and affordability. So I decided to spend my, my last couple of years of my career um, tackling what I saw as that barrier, which meant coming to HUD and looking at it from this side of the street rather than the human services side of the street. Um, and indeed, it's a barrier. NIMBYism being one of them, which is not in my backyard. And it's, the, it's an interesting one, because one of the things we all want to do is to get older. Um, you rarely hear anyone saying, I think I want to die before I get 25 so I don't get 65 because I don't want to be old. No, everybody, it's the one thing people want to do. They want to live. What they, what they often don't recognize is live where. And what they do want to live and live in their communities. I strongly agree with Robin is that we need alternatives and choices though. Everyone is not going to live in their own home in a suburban community with everything around them. Many folks will need lots of options. 
And those options will be congregate living sometimes. Sometimes it will be small communities, sometimes there will be larger communities. But our society also seems to have this feeling that anything that comes into a community that they don't want, they should have a choice not to have. Even if it's something that will benefit them 20, 30, 40 years from now. Um, I believe, and, and part of what HUD is looking at is a tackling, all, tackling all of these. It is our um, um, housing is the platform um, for all, all of our community-based issues. When you begin to look at how we live, the base of that is where we live. And the, the quality of our life is very much based in that. Right now, we're looking at several reforms. We've relied very heavily on the 202 programs for, for seniors. That's not going to cut it in the future. That's not going to be enough. It's not going to satisfy the need, and neither is going to satisfy our choice areas. So we're now looking at and having um, um, pro have reforms proposed to be able to look more at how do we combine our, our, um, our housing choices on development. How do we make sure that we can get the kinds of resources to our housing authorities in all cities um, that will combine our low-income tax credits, that will begin to look at partnerships? How do we bring the, the private sector into the discussion with public housing? And how do we encourage both to work together? And so much at the community and local level involves partnerships. How do we really work with the planning commissions? How do we work and go out and work with communities to see their own future? And while indeed some of those communities may be very young now, they are going to get older. And people are still going to want to stay in their housing. And how can we support not only the development of that new housing, but how can we support it across the board um, for all income levels? You know, Sometimes it's very easy to think about that moderate income. We have a huge population of folks who worked all their life, no. who are now living virtually on no pension, primarily on Social Security, and primarily on savings. And we need to also plan how to make sure that their only alternative is not a nursing facility the one time that they have an illness. A nursing facility is treatment. It is not home. And we need to be able to build in us our future those housing alternatives that will make that real. Great. Thank you. Uh, and uh, kind of building on, on your comments, Estelle, uh, turning to Eileen, you made reference to NORCs and functional decline and integrating services, which really speaks to ideally a system of home and community based long term supports and services including, and thank you, Estelle, transportation. Yeah. Uh, by the way, as a side note, one of the uh, almost certain causes of depression for anyone, especially an older person, is losing our driver's license. And uh, I think the great midlife crisis for baby boomers is going to be when they realize they're going to be losing their driver's license, but that's a whole other issue. But going back, Eileen, uh, home and community-based services uh, Secretary Cisneros referenced the CLASS Act, which is a public insurance program out of the Affordable Care Act, which would have begun that process of a national long-term care type insurance. Unfortunately, it's in hiatus. It's in deep freeze, and we don't know if and when we'll ever have a national policy to promote home and community-based long-term care. So, Eileen, with that kind of sad uh, status right now, how will we give people the choices for where they live and how they live if we don't have policies on home and community-based services to keep them in the home? Or what can we do well, with would, that at the state level? Well, I would say just as we plan for roads and schools, we have to plan for the retirement of the baby boomers. Mm -hmm. I'm a boomer. I remember being in classrooms with 40 students in the classrooms, and the schools were, were just you know overflowing. And so they started building more schools. And then by the 80s, we had surplus schools, and they started turning them into senior housing and senior centers. Um, I do think that there are a number of opportunities available to states, uh, particularly under the Affordable Care Act, may it remain, 
and states like Maryland, we, one of our biggest embarrassments is that about 85 percent of our Medicaid long-term care dollars are still going into institutional care. Yeah. And so we are trying to compensate for that and are taking advantage of all of the new opportunities, the community first choice, the balancing incentive programs, uh, the community living program, the veterans directed home and community based services program. And we are trying to really assemble a broad, comprehensive uh, program that will identify opportunities for uh, people with disabilities as well as older people to not have to make the nursing home the first choice. Um, we have to look at our housing environment and the relationship between that and, and hospital readmission. That's a big concern of the federal government right now, and there are a number of grant initiatives out there focusing on what we can do to decrease the likelihood that a Medicare beneficiary will end up back in the hospital. I think the, the statistics say something like 20 to 30 percent of Medicare beneficiaries who are hospitalized are re-hospitalized within 30 days. So in order for this Affordable Care Act to work, we have to address what are the big cost centers and how do we reduce the, the unnecessary expenses that are being attributed to um, these kinds of services. But I wonder, has anybody considered the environment, the living environment, and the relationship between that living environment and that person's um, outcome in, in rehospitalization? We've done a lot of work on evidence-based um, health promotion programs. We're trying to get a handle around chronic conditions and help people take charge of their health and manage chronic conditions more successfully. We have falls prevention programs. But again, are we looking at the environment that person lives in? What is it that's causing that person to fall besides the, the physical the issues, you know, what can we do with that environment? Many of our programs have addressed that, although not in as grand of a scale as I would like to see. Uh, for instance, our Medicaid waiver program gives people a choice of receiving services at home or in assisted living. For those who are at home, they can we, do, we can provide an environmental assessment by an occupational therapist, and we can use Medicaid funds to make improvements, to make accessibility improvements in that home. But the amount of dollars are limited. It's, I believe, $5,000 per year or 10,000 lifetime. And if you've got that person who doesn't have the bathroom on the first floor or who has steps and needs to address the step issue, not only to get from the first floor to the second floor, but to get in their home, or even to go into the bathroom. Um, picture yourself in a wheelchair. How many of you could get into your bathroom if you were in a wheelchair tomorrow, if you fell and broke your leg or broke a hip? And most of us have to say we couldn't. And so we, you know, we have to go back in and go to the expense of retrofitting that home and widening those doorways and, may, and maybe enlarging the bathroom. It probably would be a lot cheaper to address this from the beginning sure. in our housing design. If we were more thoughtful about housing design, we could build wider doorways. We could have um, this zero, every home with a zero threshold entrance. We could be a little more thoughtful so that people could live out their lifetime and could reduce the likelihood of accidents and injuries. Um, you all probably know the most dangerous room in the house is the bathroom. That's probably where most of our accidents and injuries occur. Uh, be, and bathing sometimes is scary for older people who are not steady and, and we're worried about lifting their feet. And, and we also spend a lot of money under our home and community-based services programs for attendant care and personal care. And if people had the ability to bathe independently, if they had, you know, roll-in showers, level surface, um, we probably could spend a little less money on the personal care. Great, thank you. And uh, moving along, and uh, by the way, just to add to your point, Eileen, you mentioned Medicaid waivers, and uh, certainly another tool is the Olmstead uh, decision, a Supreme Court decision some years back that gives states the legal ability and consumers to uh, look for the least restrictive environment. So there are still tools that we can use to create those kind of options. Some of them are legal tools. Some of the most, um, some of the greatest changes have occurred as a result of lawsuits against the states. Um, and so a lot of the states are really looking very carefully at their policies and are they encouraging people to live out their lives at home or are they having the unintended consequence of sending people prematurely into institutional care. Great. And some states have been forced to make these changes because of these legal actions. And not that I uh, want to be a troublemaker, but if any of you want to push the, the envelope on this, 
you can sue uh, HUD, you can sue the states, uh, you can sue your city council, and you can sue uh, your counties. And uh, it's how we've made progress in Los Angeles. But I'm not advocating that because. Uh, that we make progress. And uh, AARP has a great uh, legal staff, and you can use them as well. Oh, got that yeah. out of my system. Uh, Robin. Yeah. Uh, Robin, thank you uh, so much for raising the issue of uh, those at risk, the vulnerable, and my colleague Brian Hoffman and I did uh, an, uh, our contribution was to try to uh, say in so many words that uh, we're not all going to be middle income, affluent, or financially secure. And right now in the private sector at least, the housing and leisure and development and real estate community is really only interested in those of us that have financial resources. Right. What about everybody else right. that does not? And uh, Robin, I understand that uh, with the baby boomer cohort, they may run the risk of having even higher poverty levels in old age than their parents and grandparents and that more of them may be renters and homeowners compared to their parents and grandparents. Is there truth to that uh, guess, Well, truth, projection? I, don't, I don't know about truth, but I, I think <laughs> the data would suggest that, yes, this is the case, that, you know, as I said, we have reached a plateau in home ownership, certainly a plateau in home owner ownership outright. And if we didn't learn anything from this last recession about rethinking what is the question of a house and whether everybody needs to own their own home, number one, what is the future of rental housing? But as important, I think, are the choices that people need. And if we look at these, just look at the waiting lists for affordable properties in this country, it is astounding. And the waiting lists are cut because they will never be able to serve these people ever. The question of what the private sector can do, and I think one of the things that is a sh a, some, <coughs> gives me some hope is being at an organization with a lot of private nonprofit developers and providers who are recognizing <coughs> that there is an affordable market, modest and low income market, mm -hmm. and perhaps, perhaps mixed income use markets as well. I mean, if you look at some of the creative programming that's going on. Just look at Stadium Place in, in Baltimore. You know, the, I'm from Baltimore originally. I love the stadium. The fact that the stadium is gone and a nonprofit development company bid out others to take over Stadium Place and to create a mixed income, multi-use environment for the elderly is a fabulous example of what can happen all over the country. I think we have the potential to bring the private sector together with the public sector, but we do have to recognize that there just needs to be incentives. The NIMBY policy has to go down, go out, you know, go, to, go away, and maybe with mixed income and multi-use experimentation, we can move some of that. Um, and as I said, the other is, I think we need to have much more fungible sources at the policy level, bringing Medicare and Medicaid and housing dollars together. Great. Thank you. I'm going to, I, I don't want to run out of time, and you've been a wonderful and patient audience, so let's do our open discussion, but we'll build from the comments that will come from those that begin to line up, and uh, you lined up first, and then Donna second, and please, those that would like to comment, respond, ask a question, we are here for you. Yes. Just building on, Robin, what you were speaking about, um, I'm actually wearing the hat from the Board of Congress for the New Urbanism, and so certainly embrace anything having to do with walkable, mixed-use communities. I'm interested in town square settings and your ability to layer, and the ability to layer some HUD initiatives around existing main streets and existing town squares. And for example, the whole multi-decade effort for Main Streets programs, an example, uh, the Department of Community Affairs spun off the Georgia Cities Foundation, mm -hmm. and it's got probably a couple of decades of now giving gap financing for projects such as theaters and hotels and mm -hmm. retrofit and infill. 
adapting congregate living mm -hmm. to that environment and really layering to maximize the resources that have all, already gone in to create uh, vibrant, walkable communities. Um, the, the senior housing in those settings would be so appropriate and would just take it to the next level. Can you steer some of your work and programs towards these existing town squares? Please, Robin or whomever here. Well, and and I we'll think have uh, pithy I, responses so we can get I mean, I actually message. think that is what's going on right now. I mean, everything that we are looking at in our work is it, looking at natural laboratories that are existing. And what is interesting is what communities have been able to do despite broken policies. They have cobbled together, whether it's using HUD money, whether it's using HHS money, state money, local money, local, in, local uh, community-based investment dollars. Yes, all of these are being built around existing main streets. The question is whether we can learn from what's being done now, and most of this is being done in rural, in urban and, and uh, suburban areas. I think the real question is going to be what's going to happen in our rural communities, mm -hmm. which is a very different issue, but which is where we have the oldest populations in the United States. Right. But yes, everything, I mean, we need to start with where we are right now, because there's a lot of opportunity to use what we already have existing. Great, thank you. Uh, let me, uh, Donna, and please, all of you can jump in as well, but I want to get the process going. Donna Butts with Generations United, and thank you for a wonderful morning. There's, we've touched a little bit on multi-generational households and the increase in multi-generational households, but one family structure we haven't really talked about are grandparents raising grandchildren, mm -hmm. where there's not a middle generation there. There have been some housing developments that have sprung up around the country, mm -hmm. but also we've seen incidences where grandparents have taken children into senior-only housing developments and basically been accused of harboring children and evicted. Mm -hmm. right. So one th thought that I'd like to hear you talk about is, what do you think about the idea as we're looking forward to living in an aging society that we eliminate senior-only housing? Who would like to tackle that? I'll, I'll start with that. Um, first, there are a sizable number of households in which grandparents are raising grandchildren. And it's, a, it's becoming more common, not less. Um, so I think it's something we need to plan for. Um, I think one of the key factors, though, has to be choice. Um, I'm not sure we have. Um, we, we tend to, to stovepipe our housing, um, and then who's left over um, has, has no choice, practically. Um, so we need the kind of housing where grandparents raising children feel comfortable, where they feel safe. Mm -hmm. We also have to have the kind of housing where those are some seniors who still believe that they want to have the choice of not having young families around. Um, whether we have too much or not enough of either one, I would tell we, we don't have enough of anything. Uh, but not to recognize the um, need for grandparents raising their children in a safe uncomfortable environment is critically important. Um, I'm not sure I would take away all seniors only housing, but I would approach it from if you have senior only housing, you have to have housing for seniors with children also, um, so that you have both populations covered. But part of this, we live in a society that really values choice. Um, and we need to be able to meet that choice no matter what it is. Home builders, the uh, 50 plus housing council, the multifamily council, and the low income housing tax credit rental people. Wow. Uh, <laughs> you've, you've all talked to things that, that apply to our members. But I think the biggest, one of the biggest problems, besides at the moment, lack of access to credit to do anything, um, is the resistance among people in the community to rental housing and other sorts of housing. A member recently told me he had put together, got pretty far along in the planning, of a community that was about half more traditional suburban housing and half smaller scale, more walkable, denser, universally designed housing was shot down completely because of the density. They wouldn't give him the extra density. Another developer once told me that he wanted to build rental housing for seniors in another suburban community and the local residents bought it bought it because they equated aging with illness, and they said, oh, we don't want all those ambulances on our street. 
Um, so who's going to do the public education involved in getting people to understand that user-friendly housing is not a threat to them? Who would like to tackle that one? Uh, who hasn't had a chance? Eileen? Oh, are you? Anybody here? I, I would say, let me take the first shot and turn it over. Okay. Clearly, um, um, housing discrimination, of which NIMBY is, is part of the responsibility of HUD. And our fair housing um, um, equal opportunity has that as their focus. Um, we've probably brought more lawsuits of recent um, than we have in the past. We, know we have local partners that work with us on this. And I think what we need is just people coming forward and saying, we need, your, we need your presence. We need the clout and the bully pulpit. Uh, but NIMBYism violates most um, fair housing laws. Eileen, I, I and then say, Nancy? I would say all of us have a responsibility to um, promote that. I, I remember an a interview I had with a newspaper reporter once who was calling me about one of our counties that had restrictions on multifamily housing because of the school overcrowding. And so the county was not allowing multifamily housing, family housing to be built unless the school system, the local schools could support that. So what was happening was there was no more family housing being built and the developers could build senior housing because they didn't have to worry about the impact on the schools. So the reporter basically was saying to me that, that this was a, a you know, a problem, that there was too much senior housing being built and that and there was clearly there was discrimination against the senior housing and, and questioning this and it was only because that these builders couldn't build family housing. And I had to tell the reporter to go back and look at the census data, look at the large number of seniors that lived in that county. These builders would not be building senior housing if they didn't feel the market was there to support it. But, but it was troubling. It was a very troubling conversation I had. Thank you, Eileen. Uh, Nancy? I, I was just going to add, I think in general there's a tremendous need for education on a lot of these issues. And education, we, we look at it as uh, getting some of our members more educated and engaged in their communities. And we think there's going to be a way to do that because people want to volunteer and do things uh, where they are. Um, on a couple of the specific points you raised, um, uh, one thing, we had one community where we had an activist who'd been worked very hard to get a uh, zoning uh, provision changed and we had done, or she had done everything she thought she could do and finally about a year later I noticed she was on the city council. Um, uh, that isn't necessarily happening everywhere. The other thing is what, what we're also finding is in, in places where, where people are able to solve problems, overcome some of these restrictions, um, having that information available, uh, we do this across our states and communities, helps a lot because uh, in some places you need uh, litigation and other places you need the bully pulpit and uh, it, it really varies by community. Thank you. Uh, by the way, having served as the Vice President of the Los Angeles uh, Planning Commission, if I've learned anything is that people value more than their children and grandchildren the value of their property <laughs> or the perceived value of their property. Yeah. Uh, yes, ma'am. Oh, who was, oh, were you next? Okay. okay. I'm uh, Tanya Washington Stern from the D.C. Office of Planning. Uh, speak up, please. Sure. Tanya Washington Stern, the D.C. Office of Planning. I wanted to ask uh, about a couple of personal observations that I've had. Um, I'm with the Generation X. My parents are baby boomers in their <coughs> 60s, uh, relatively recently retired. And one of the things I've observed with them as well as with other acquaintances and relatives who are in that age range and older is that what I now consider to be elderly, the age range has gotten much, much higher because I see a lot of people, baby boomers and those older than that, just being very, very active in a lot of different aspects in their lives. And so I guess part one of my question is, how, how is that going to impact what senior housing looks like in the mm. future? Because the 55 plus model to me doesn't really make sense when I look at my own parents, they own their own homes. Yeah. Um, and the other part of it is that um, the older members of the Generation X will be in their, start to enter their 50s within the next five years or less. Mm -hmm. And Good with point. my generation and those younger than us, we are oftentimes having children at later ages, meaning that we're much older and still having school age or college age children, say into your 60s, for instance, 50s and 60s. Um, we're also having to work longer because we don't have those pensions um, anymore. And so 
I'm also wondering if there's been any thought about what senior housing is going to look like even further out in the future for those in my generation and younger. Great, hmm. great question. Good Who would question. like to give a quick reply to that? Uh, Robin? Well, yeah. I mean, one of the things that I do think about a lot, and, and you know, you can't have a very long lens here in D.C., but um, what I do anyway is that just looking at your generation, and I think recognizing the economic situation, this is why rethinking what is housing, what does housing mean, what does home ownership mean, what does rental mean, that we have to have a major paradigmatic shift not just for the baby boomers, but it's actually for the generations coming after the baby boomers. We have almost, we have to have sets of cohort activity because there are certain things that are pretty much given with the, with the baby boomer generation, although this last recession has really taken a significant hit there. But it is those newer generations and what are the issues around that, them that need to be rethought. 55 to me is, is not elderly. We're looking at, the average age now in low-income housing is 78 to 80. That is very different from 35 years ago in low-income housing when, where pe the average age was 62. So I think you're absolutely right. We need to redefine really what we're talking about, even as aging. But I also think we need to think about cohorts, generations, and what are the implications here. Good. Nancy, did you want to address that and the work you're doing? Well, I, you know, at, at, at AARP, we say um, 60 is the new 30, uh, or, or at least I do, given my age. Um, but um, we, we know that um, various ages that we think of certain conditions are, are just not going to be that way um, uh, in the future. And I think the key is what others have said, which is the opportunity for choices and, uh, and options, and uh, understanding that um, financially, as people are, are, are aging now, they have less saved. And there are going to be more, more challenges there. But we have to think about it in, in wholly different ways. And uh, one of the advantages, I think, of some of the communities in which we're working in this all-age friendly um, uh, set of stuff is, is that there are people of all generations involved. And it's beginning to, I think, give, give us a new sense of what's going to be needed. Great. I also believe that 55, it's, it's hard when, when you're facing 70, 55 absolutely doesn't sound old. <laughs> In fact, it sounds incredibly young. Um, but it, it's, it's young, and um, I, 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 just as a quick antidote, my grandmother lived to be 109. Um, and actually saw three centuries. Wow. Um, so I'm trying to figure out in her in her vocabulary, 80 was um, young, and when she in the last couple of years of her life in assisted living, she wouldn't eat with the old people uh, because people you you you're, she, they looked old to her, and she was still pretty active. I think we need to change our whole paradigm of what age is, and it can't be necessarily governed by an age. Right. It's right. governed by who you are and what you are. So looking now at, at policy, I think the federal government now needs to struggle with what, what the ages are for this. Right. Thank you for your question. By the way, defining what it means to be old, that's like going to your high school reunion and you walk in and you think, that can't be my class, they're too old. <laughs> <laughs> and you realize that is my class. Yes, ma'am. Yes, good morning. <laughs> um, listening to you all this morning, I, I appreciate all the, the statistics. It, it just seems like a crisis in the making for individuals and for our society. I guess I'd like to hear some thoughts about how, how we educate our, our society about this looming problem. You know, every night we see financial planning commercials, and they're always the people that you know, look like me, silver-haired, looking to the future. How do we begin to educate our society about this issue? Because it, it, it is, to me, a crisis right. in the making. Mm -hmm. Let's just have a few quick responses. You will be the last person, I believe 11.30 is our cutoff. And so uh, responses to a great question on how we educate and re-socialize society. Who would like to tackle that one? I'll start. Eileen. I, I would say all of us um, are in a position through our own networks to play a leadership role through our communications, through the use of social media, 
through events, uh, training, conferences, um, just, just in general, um, have the ability, I think, to put out best practices in front of people and to stimulate discussion and to get the conversation going right. around these issues. Thank you. And um, I'll just add, in, in our chapter, Brian Hoplin and I introduced this concept of a personal longevity plan where we begin to educate all ages, but in particular K through 12 and college, and have people begin to assume, what if I live to be 100 years of age? How will I prepare for that longer lifespan? Just as we use Smokey the Bear uh, to stop forest fire and stop kids from burning down forest fires, just as we had this successful anti-smoking campaign, mm -hmm. Could we not begin to re-socialize all of us, especially at younger ages, for this never before experienced phenomenon that we could live to be up to 100 years of age? Just uh, a thought. And uh, let me just have this individual. Hi. My name is uh, Christy Bowman. I work with Civic Works and uh, run a program called Neighborhoods for All Ages. Uh, I'm really interested, we've seen kind of in the past couple of years, the combining of aging policy and disability policy. Oh, thank you. Uh, and I'm really interested to hear how that shapes this argument. Great. Mm -hmm. I, may I tackle that yeah, one please. real quick? It, uh, uh, I have the unique privilege of being uh, the poster boy for aging with a disability. And uh, as a polio survivor involved in gerontology, and also as a Latino, I've been given the great destiny of being part of three trendy groups. Uh, but anyway, which is why probably why I'm here. <laughs> uh, but most recently, uh, just last week, Secretary Sebelius uh, announced the creation of a new federal agency in HHS, the Agency for Community Living, which will include the Administration on Aging, the HHS Office on Disability, and the Administration for the Developmentally Disabled. That's just one indicator that I, be, I believe we are now beginning to see bridges and connections and coalitions between younger persons with disability who incidentally are enjoying a longer lifespan, mm -hmm. older persons and their advocates who will certainly, I think as Robin pointed out, face chronic conditions, disability, mobility limitations, but with the compression of morbidity at a later age. And the reality that all of us, through a sports accident, a traffic accident, being hit as a pedestrian, will always face the possibility of an injury or disability. So uh, I think uh, at least the advocacy groups in the disability rights community, the senior advocacy groups are realizing that we have common cause especially when it comes to choices, mm -hmm. where we live, and how we want to grow old. And yeah. uh, I think with that, perhaps it's a good way to close this session. I know there was others wanting to ask questions. You'll have opportunities during lunch and throughout the afternoon. But let me thank and let me have you thank our wonderful panel here of experts. Thank you, folks. <laughs>